you are still the voice of wrestling today in AEW, right? And um, I know that when you first got there, I've seen you answering people on Twitter because you, you know how Twitter is, right? There'd be yeah, criticism. Yeah. I really yeah. feel like yourself, Tony and Excalibur, you've really found your groove as a trio. And I know you've often said this in the past that chemistry is, is an important thing. Talk to me about that. You know, AEW now hitting million regularly, right? The momentum. How does it feel to be a part of that family? Has it reinvigorated you? I think it has to a certain degree because, uh, I, I signed with Tony Khan a little over two years ago, uh, back in the spring before we debuted in the fall. And, uh, I had in my mind, I thought, well, this will be my last, uh, gig. You know, I'm 69 years old when my contracts in ends, I'll be 70. And so then you start, well, you know, how much longer are you going to do this? Well, I love doing it. I got no reason financially or emotionally. I love to work. You know, they say that if you do something that you love, Alex, it's not work. Mm -hmm. It's what you love to do. And it's, I have no problem getting up in the morning and going to work. I like it. And, uh, so, uh, but I, I thought we had a chance to provide alternative pro wrestling programming. Uh, I liked, uh, some of the talents that Tony had hired, like Chris Jericho, for example, uh, John Moxley, you know, Dustin Rhodes has still got plenty of mileage left in him. And those guys bring a lot of other things to the table. They bring leadership. They're captains of the team. They're locker room leaders. I feel good about that. And then, uh, he had, he hired some guys that once I saw some, uh, YouTube stuff on them, uh, they had been bas basically working in the Indies. Yeah. Uh, I thought that, well, you know, we got a chance here And some of these young kids that we've, uh, groomed or are grooming. You know, MJF, for example, a young Paul Heyman, that's what he is to me. And I knew Paul Heyman when he was young and I got him a gig on national television mm. as my co-host back in the day in WCW. Uh, and then of course we, re, re uh, renewed that one, uh, in, uh, in WWE for a while. Yeah. 2001. And, yeah. And, uh, that was a good year. And, uh, so then, you know, guys like, as I mentioned, MJF. Uh, Darby Allen is a, has gotten over with the audience or Darby's a TV ratings guy. He, people for whatever reason, for their own reasons, they love this kid. He's the underdog. He's undersized. He's got great fight, great heart. And if nothing else, we can all identify with that to some degree, mm -hmm. you know, at some point in our lives, you're going to be an underdog. And so how do you handle it? How do you, how do you build on that? Uh, jungle boy, Jack uh, Perry, I think has got a huge future. Um, I mentioned MJF, uh, Sammy Guevara is going to be a huge star. Wardlow is going to be, he may be the man for us yeah. within the next, within the next year or so, uh, Alex, he's, uh, he's got everything you look for in a, in a talent. He's got the size, the athleticism, great attitude, uh, character integrity. So I thought, well, you know, we got to. We had a chance here, and, but I had no idea how proficient, uh, Tony Khan was going to be at cre in creative. Mm -hmm. He's just really good. And, uh, he's not, uh, lost his, his fandom. So, uh, I really thought that this was going to be my last gig. I still think that, uh, when that end date is, I'm not quite sure, but it'll be sooner than later. You know, it's inevitable, but, uh, I'm having a blast. I'm, I'm, I'm living my dream again, and I'm being able to do play by play without being told what to say at every turn in the road. Mm -hmm. And he lets us work. Uh, I enjoy working with Shivani and Excalibur because I like both of them. I, I, there's a, you know, I, I just, I feel a kinship with them mm -hmm. and I, I like working with them. I like helping Excalibur raise his game. Uh, you know, I was teasing him the other day. He got voted, uh, the wrestling observer, uh, announcer of the year. And I said, that's, I congratulated him, gave him a hug. I said, now all you gotta do is win 14 more and you'll tie me. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Shivani and I've been friends since my goodness, the late eighties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we did the first class of champions together and, and, and worked together a lot and we're friends. We have a lot of common interests. 
you know, uh, so I like my partners. I like making them look good, helping them look, be better. We exchange ideas. I make suggestions. They make suggestions to me. So we have great communication and I, that's, a, that's crucial. You gotta have that. So, uh, I'm with a good team I think, I don't think we've scratched the surface of how good we can be because as you mentioned, it takes time and to develop that chemistry where things become second nature and almost a feel thing. I had that with Lawler, the King, so much. uh, you know, uh, it was, he knew what I was going. He, I knew where he was headed. It was just a good scenario. And then, uh, and with Paul Heyman too, to a, a little bit, maybe because of only time, but maybe a little lesser degree than Lawler. Cause I was at Lawler for over a decade. Hmm. And, uh, but I, I, I've had good partners. I've been very lucky uh, to have the partners I've had. So, and I'm not a big three man booth guy. I don't, I'm not a big fan of it, but I've changed I'm changing my attitude toward it, Alex, because I am having so much damn fun and I like those guys. I enjoy seeing them again when I see them and, and we're, we are cordial and is we don't have, we're not mired in politics. We're not mired in jealousies, things of that nature. It's so much more pleasant than uh, the business can be. Yeah. I think you can tell that you guys are having fun and, uh, you know, I mean that from a work perspective and you like each other and it's interesting what you say about the young talent as well. I mean, you know, a hangman, Adam page in there as well. Jade, Car Jade Cargill looks like, wow. I mean, Brock Lesnar upside in, in her. <laughs> I mean, yeah. uh, it, it's, it's one of those things, man. You look at that roster and the reason I kind of segue onto the talent now, obviously as a kid, I just adored you as a commentator, right? I, I didn't know that you wore all the hats that you did. And honestly, I only learned this as I got older and, you know, the internet and then reading your book and all these things. I think it's fascinating, your track record of who you signed in WWE. Like, really fascinating. Because you could, you could, you could argue, like, a golden age of talent there. Right. Look, I mean, The Rock was kind of under your auspices. I know Pat Patterson involved in all that stuff. But same with Gerald Briscoe bringing in Lesnar. But you're the guy that signed these guys. Like... Talk to me about um, having your hand in signing them, like when you saw them, um, because as we just noticed with the way you spoke about the talent you've seen today, you obviously have always had a good nose for talent. Been lucky, Alex. Uh, I think I relate to them. Uh, talents want to be related to as athletes, not entertainers. That's my take. Mm -hmm. It's not the gospel. It's my opinion. Uh, and I always treat them like athletes, teammates. You try to build a com camaraderie and a, and a team uh, element there. Uh, but you know, we were very fortunate with some of the guys that we signed who have gone on to become hall of famers, rich, uh, secure. Uh, and I feel really good about being able to help facilitate that. You know, I knew that, uh, the rock was Rocky Johnson's son and Rocky Johnson and, and Pat Patterson were friends from the San Francisco territory days. And Pat was incessant talking about, uh, Dwayne. And so of course I went down and met with Dwayne and talk contract and recruiting and things of that nature. Uh, so he was easy sign, uh, uh, easy guy to get signed. He wanted to be there. He wanted to come to WWE. He wanted to be a star. And then, uh, you know, he we had that one. Yeah. Yeah. He's done all right. Uh, and, uh, and the beautiful thing about Dwayne Johnson is, is that his fame and his amazing fortune, I think he made $82 million last year. That's a lot, that's a lot of cash where I come from. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so he hasn't changed. He still take a call. He'll still return a text message. Uh, if I needed something, I'll give you a little a story. He was, he was somewhere in Europe taping or filming a movie when my, the, the day my wife got, uh, uh, killed and, uh, I was at the hospital sitting with her. She was on life support and my, her family had not had time to fly in from California yet. So, uh, my phone rings and it's Dwayne. So it's like, you know, I don't know what time it was where he was. It's like middle of the night where I was. But it just shows he's not too big to reach out to an old friend and offer the condolences. He knew my wife, you know, she was a big part of the administration there, quite frankly. Yeah. And then, you know, we had that one class, uh, I convinced a big man that Austin was a player 
and Paul Heyman kind of opened our eyes to Steve's talking, but I knew Steve when he was in Dallas and I got him to come to WCW. Same thing with undertaker. He was the punisher or something like that. I got to liking him. We brought him to Atlanta. And then I, when uh, it come time for his contract to be renewed, Ole Anderson was the booker and Ole wasn't real high on Mark, the undertaker, which I never could understand. Might, might've been the old wrestling thing. It wasn't his idea. Mm. So I'm the one that encouraged Mark, uh, the taker to take McMahon's offer and get the hell out of here. Be good for him. And then we had one class there. We just, we struck gold on everybody. It was just one of those deals. You know, I saw Brock Lesnar wrestle on television as an amateur. Cheryl Briscoe, my good friend from Oklahoma had all the amateur connections. And ironically, Brock Lesnar's high school, or excuse me, Brock Lesnar's college coach was a teammate of Gerald Briscoe at Oklahoma state university. Wow. And uh, so that was a, that's fate. So then, uh, we could have signed Brock a year ahead of time, but we made a deal with his coach that we would leave him alone until, uh, he, he wrestled his senior year his last year in college, <clears throat> pardon me, at which he won the national championship was an all American. He was the, he was the number one amateur wrestler in America. Uh, you know, then we had another class where I signed Lesnar in that class with, uh, John Cena. Yeah. Orton Batista, Batista and Shelton Benjamin, Randy Orton, it's pretty good. Some pretty good talent. Yeah. Uh, and they, they achieved everything we envisioned them to, to achieve. They were just wonderful. They made it. They, they got a taste of the good life. They were motivated by money, you know, not it's just, not just the love of the game, but they want to make big money and life changing money. And each and every one of them have now secured their future financially edge and Christian. Mm. You know, we got Christian now on our team and AEW and he's not only, he's like a player coach. He's great for the young talent to ask questions of and, and to talk to and get counseling from. So uh, I'm really proud of the roster that Tony Khan has assembled in AEW, but it, but, uh, like I'm trying to explain here, it takes a little bit of luck sometimes, Alex, to be, uh, to have that kind of good fortune, you know, I, I remember, um, obviously Mick Foley as well is another one. Um, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. We all know the famous Vince McMahon story on that one. Uh, one wanted you to break your heart. Is that the right wording? I don't know. Yeah. Um, that's what it was. He said, you need to know what it's like for a talent that you believe so strongly in to breaking your heart. You need to know what that feels like. Well, and I was willing to take that chance and, and book my bet, my reputation that I had a good eye for talent. You know, uh, that's what I thought. And, uh, I was hopeful that, uh, Mick would do great things. And obviously he did. Yeah. He wrote best selling books. He was a champion, the WWE champion. Uh, you know, he was just a great locker room role model. And I, I think all those things are important. I don't, I think some of your best football clubs in the, in the UK have got to have great team chemistry. Sure. They got to believe in each other and they got to, they got to have a, a strong camaraderie. And I think that's what we developed there in, in WWE during the attitude era was our locker room was very competitive. They were, they were motivated like they were athletes and they were, and they responded in a positive way to that treatment. 